let's start. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending this. We what we hope will be really useful, interesting, practical and uh, empowering um, session about developing your confidence as governors in addressing race equality. Uh, and we title it the launch of our new school's guidance. So what I'll be doing today is first of all introducing myself. My name is Atia Gole. I'm the lead for equality, participation and partnership in children's services in the County Council. My job today is to open and facilitate this session. Uh, I'm also uh, the lead for the team that has helped support the development of the guidance in partnership with our three speakers who I'll introduce in a moment. I wanted first of all to set the context for today's session. Um, we were um, on um, target to revise the guidance in any case this year. However, in the context of the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on Black, Asian and minority ethnic people in this country and the death of George Floyd, uh, we decided to take a bit longer to revise and update the guidance. It was planned to be out earlier on this year because we wanted to involve uh, parents, we wanted to involve young people, we wanted to have more input from the teacher, so Bola was pulled on, on board, because what we wanted to really do was to demonstrate that commitment of involving uh, you know, all relevant stakeholders in, in this work um, to support the schools in positively promoting race equality. The guidance also has new forwards from Stuart and Count Stuart Gallimore, the director and councillor Stanley, who is the lead elected member for schools and learning. So uh, first of all, I'd like you to make sure that you've turned your mics off and your cameras because that does interfere with the optimum um, performance of MS teams, especially since we've got such a large number of people, which is fantastic on this session. I also want to say thank you to Claire who sent out the agenda and also all the associated um, notes about um, best use of MS Teams. But also I hope you've enjoyed the video recording by Youth Cabinet uh, and also the link that we sent to John Amici's piece on BBC Bite Size. We did try and show these on MS Teams at a previous session, but it doesn't quite work so well. So we thought I should just send it out to you. I hope you enjoyed them. And if you want to give it any feedback on those, please use the chat along the side. That'd be brilliant. The aims of this session, because we are uh, you know, used to setting objectives, so we're clear what this is about, they're threefold. The first one is to present new guidance and share current theory, debates, good practice and resources to embed race equality in schools. Uh, second is to develop uh, governor confidence in this topic. And thirdly is to enable discussion and questions for the panel um, at the end of the session. Next slide, please, Claire. So the next slide is the agenda. And so I'm going to go through that just a little bit um, to give you a bit of you know clarity around where we're going. We do have a series of speakers, three speakers, Dr. Yar Asare, and she will introduce herself as well when she starts. Um, she's going to be talking about identity and belonging, the theory and debate, sort of setting that context. Um, and then 15 minutes later, we'll have Bola, who is a teacher in an East Sussex school, and she will be very much talking from her experience as, a, as an educator in the classroom and share some of her good practice um, and pointers to, to some of the theory as well, actually, but um, taking it sort of the next step further in relation to how does that relate to practice. And um, then another 15 minutes later, Dr. Mandy Curtis will talk further around a range of resources 
that um, she and working with others uh, developed and also signposts to in relation to developing governor and teacher confidence. Um, so I would say that that um, both Bola and Mandy will be taught bringing that theory to life through practice and links to resources. And then it will come back to me and I will open up for half an hour to have a questions and discussion. Um, and I will take those questions very much through the chat and put them to the three uh, panel members in terms of their um, response to that. So I hope that makes sense. Um, next slide, please, Claire. So this is a quite a long statement here, but I, we wanted to share it. We received this um, only about 10 days ago, and it was a letter from a parent who wanted to talk to us about how their child felt when the topic of slavery was presented in class during Black History Month. She said that there was no context and no discussion. The child expressed sadness. And she said, I think some shame being the only person of color in their class. What she also said, it was good on the class teacher for teaching something about black history. But she says, I'm aware that some of the that some reflection is needed about how this feels for the child. And in particular, those children who are black and mixed heritage, who this child was. She also said very honestly that meanwhile, as a family, we continue to share with the children what we call examples of black excellence. So they are receiving a balanced view of their identity and culture. So the context here is that the topic was just raised very much um, in isolation. There was no context in relation to history or culture. And the child felt that there wasn't uh, an opportunity for discussion. The teacher, we also heard, had taken the PowerPoint presentation from Twinkle, some of you will know of this, and did not seem to have any input into what she was sharing. The child felt that therefore as a learner she didn't come away um, having a sense of discussion uh, and knowing other people's opinions and also understanding how slavery came about. The class were given no time to discuss their views and thoughts. The teacher asked some generic questions as a whole group. Um, for example, is this the way people should be treated? And all the class said no. And the child whose parents said this had said they would have liked to have heard more from her peers. So she did not feel that the history only pertained to her as a person of color. She felt that it was rushed and quickly done. And then they went home again. Again, no space to think or to process it. And she felt that the lesson did not focus enough on who was involved, who made it happen and who controlled it, which are really interesting questions for a primary school young person around you know, power and the role of education. So next slide, please. Um, and this is interesting because the parent um, asked the child. I mean, in fact, we, we, we uh, when we received the email, we said, you know, it would be fantastic to get that. Um, any thoughts because we knew we were coming to share with you the resource that the child um, wished to make around what might have been better ways the topic could have been discussed and um, she came up with some you know really interesting useful examples which are actually highlighted in the guidance really think about the resources you're using be really clear about your own meaning the teacher's input allow time for proper discussion about these issues. And also when she's talking about the first in terms of the first black scientist, uh, you probably never, you probably never actually the first black scientist, but in relation to how they're perceived, talk about why racism, uh, about racism and why it's uh, made and still makes it challenging for black people to be in certain jobs. And then I think we're talking here, coming back to the point when talking about slavery, talk about who made it and who controlled it. So I wanted to really share this with you as um, a start because it was you know, a letter that we received and it's really timely. And um, she gave fantastic input about what would have made that conversation better in the classroom. Claire, second slide, next slide, please. So we also wanted to share this. Um, and um, this is in, in the light of the 
video that um, we circulated to you where John Amici was talking about the difference between being not racist and anti-racist. And we talk about this in the context of this wonderful diagram that we still are finding it difficult to uh, get the, the um, reference for, which is really interesting because we've used it several times now, but it's proving quite difficult to find out um, where this was found. And what's really good is in the same way as any learning, and we say this to you know teachers in, in teacher training, but I'm getting um, some comments that not every, everybody's able to see the slides. So I don't know if that's everybody or just a couple of people. If you could put that in the chat, that be, that would be um, great. Well, so if you can't see it, I will explain this diagram that I'm looking at. Um, it talks about three zones that the journey to becoming anti-racist moves from the fear zone, which includes things like I deny racism is a problem, I avoid hard questions, I strive to be comfortable to the learning zone where you're starting to ask questions that might make me feel uncomfortable, I educate myself about race and structural racism, I listen to others who think and look differently than me, to the growth zone, which is very much about I speak out when I see racism in action, and that's the sort of actively anti-racist. I sit with my discomfort. I yield positions of power to those otherwise marginalized, and I think we're trying to do that in terms of that voice, that example from the young person, to start off with that. Um, and also, I think this is important, I identify how I may benefit from racism. So that's our journey into the growth. So next slide, please, Claire. Um, and I like to use this quote from, um, you know, an Indian thinker. The problem is not how to wipe out all our differences, but how to unite with our differences intact. And that's part of that approach on understanding um, race equality in the context of diversity and inclusion. And uh, final slide, I think it is now. Um, coming back to the race equality guidance, actually it's not the final slide, there are three more slides. The race equality guidance for schools is now up on C-Zone. Um, so we're using this evening as an opportunity to highlight it, to promote it. Please have a look at it. We have had wonderful input from Mandy and Bola and Yahoo who are going to speak today. Um, next slide. You probably can't see the index, but I really what I want to show you is that it's it has the forward from our youth cabinet. It includes um, support from the director, Stuart Gallimore and Councillor Stanley, and, and it talks through the rationale and, um, and principles as well as a developing a whole school approach. And that whole school approach is very much about teaching and learning about developing governor and teacher confidence, which is very much today, um, ensuring participation enrollment of the whole school community, promoting that positive sense of identity and belonging, addressing racist incidents and racist bullying within the school, having your appropriate policies and audits, monitoring and evaluation, and finally, um, a, a section which is a new section which we did not have in the last iteration, supporting our black and minority ethnic staff. And the next slide, Claire. Um, and this we felt uh, was uh, again, if there's any, if there's just one thing that uh, you want to read in that guy in the guide, is I would read the forwards, and I would have a look as governors the checklist because that's a really useful tool for you to talk to your um, you know, uh, your colleagues and um, senior management team in schools in relation to, you know, where where is the school in relation to the checklist. So definitely have a look at that when you look at the guidance. And um, hopefully within a year, should, you should be ticking those all off. Um, and you're, you're certainly then on, on your way on that journey to becoming an anti-racist school. So what I would like to do is just to, to uh, move on to the substantive presentations. There will be three presentations, as I said. So there are quite long, 15 minutes, but they, they, we 
done a dry run of this and they're very full, fantastic, but I'm going to be quite strict about timing with this uh, to make sure that we keep each speaker keeps to the 15 minutes. Um, please keep your comments and questions on chat and both Claire and I will be picking up any questions. So Claire, if I miss a question and you think, OK, somebody asked something that has not been responded to, please pipe up and then we'll ask the panel to respond. Um, and really, we'll, we'll get on with the first presentation from Ya. So next slide. Not next slide, I've got a slightly different one. Can we go back? Because Charlotte would be very annoyed if I don't mention that slide. Um, and I'm just about within my 15 minutes. Uh, look at this again. Remember, we have got the PSHE hubs and they are there to support you. So please, again, think about them in relation to support and resources. OK, now, yeah, we're still 7.15. Great, so yeah, over to you. 15 minutes, a focus on belonging and identity in relation to race equality in our schools. OK, thank you very much, Atia. I hope everyone can hear me OK. So I want to talk to you this evening about the pupils in our schools and the link between the sense of belonging in a school community and the development of a positive sense of identity. I'd like to present some ideas about how what we teach through the curriculum is key to ensuring that pupils of colour and of minority ethnicity are positioned as part of our national community. How should we understand the implications of systems of disadvantage that operate in the UK? And how can we resist calls that suggest that these systems no longer exist? Next slide, please. If you feel that you belong, you feel invested, you feel that you matter, you feel a part of the whole group or classroom or school so that you know that what you do matters and that you matter within that school community. If you feel you belong at school, you are likely to study harder. You are confident that you will be supported and you work hard to succeed. This was my experience at Settlescombe Primary School back in the 1960s. I was invited without question to feel a deep sense of belonging to the school and I was encouraged to work hard, to enjoy my years at school and to have an early incentive of knowing that I could make a success of my life. As the only child of mixed race in the school, it could have been so very different and I could so easily have been marginalised and made to feel strange. But great leadership and a strong sense of the school community made my primary experience enjoyable. Next slide. Years later, then a student at the University of Sussex studying sociology in the late 70s, I sat for hours in the university library reading copies of a publication called Race Today and learning that the experiences of many other people of colour had not been so positive. It was here that I learnt of the effects of a more insidious racism, much more concerted and powerful than the few instances of racism that I had experienced during my childhood. This was the collective educational experience of young black pupils who had been given a sense of not belonging in British schools. The injustice of this struck me harshly as I first read about black pupils positioning as troublesome and unintelligent and heard about Bernard Coward's seminal text, how the West Indian child is made educationally subnormal in the British school system. But this was published in 1971. Surely the narrative has changed since then. After university, I worked as a community development worker with black and minority ethnic communities for nearly 30 years, often working directly to support black parents. Over the years, I learned about the difficult experiences of numerous children and the struggles of their parents, initially in London, but then in Hastings and Lewis, and more recently in Brighton. Children of families were often not offered the opportunity to build a sense of belonging 
and not allowed to feel part of their school community. How then can we understand this process of marginalisation of black children in the education system that has been active in the UK since the early 1960s? And how can we act against it? My argument is that we sometimes need to look beyond individual schools and teachers to systems of injustice. We need to consider what issues around race impact on our schools here in East Sussex and how systems can make themselves felt in the context of the classroom. Next slide, please. 10 years ago, in 2010, I completed my doctorate, looking at whether and how cultural diversity is taught in majority white schools, and particularly what effect this has on the experiences of pupils of colour. My findings suggested that there was fear among some teachers to engage with issues of race, fear of getting it wrong. Often they had a lack of experience of cultural diversity in their own lives and careers. And subsequently, many teachers preferred not to explore these issues in the classroom. I also found a keenness in minority ethnic pupils to engage with cultural diversity. They were eager to discuss race and culture in the classroom and disappointed at not being able to do so. Racist incidents are seen as an aberration to be dealt with individually rather than as a symptom that wider racist discourse, often stemming from home, needs to be challenged more concertedly in the whole school context. And I found that concepts of traditional culture being taught about as fixed entities seemed to encapsulate the way the cultural diversity was taught as something traditional and stagnant rather than as experienced and relevant. I now teach about race and ethnicity in British society at the University of Brighton and to get students engaged with how the educational system positions issues of race and ethnicity, I ask them to remember how and what they were taught about difference in schools. Each time I ask, I get a similar response. Those who are educated in multicultural schools were immersed in an everyday normality of difference. The ethnicities of their pupils and increasingly those of their teachers reflected the racial mix of the places that they lived in. And the teaching embraced the cultures and perspectives that wove together to offer an exciting world view. The students that grew up in the countryside or outside of cities tend to be less enthusiastic about what they learnt in schools about diversity. They had little cultural difference in their schools. They often did not learn about diversity and were not educated to explore or understand diversity or racial injustice. So as I found in my doctoral research, although children of colour in majority white schools may receive a high standard of academic education, they miss out on an important aspect of being educated for the wider world and having their own identities nurtured. We cannot expect our pupils in the less ethnically diverse schools in which we teach to learn about diversity through osmosis. We need to make a concerted effort to teach about diversity, because as one of our leading British academics on race, Paul Gilroy suggests, diversity and reactions to it are at the core of British life, not at the periphery. The approach in our schools in here in East Sussex needs to be a concerted examination of diversity, not as learning about fixed cultural differences, but of cultures as a fluid dynamic component in how we relate to each other, concerned with issues of power and social justice, as, as well as of cultural expressions. Next slide, please. What is the impact of identity development if racial stereotypes, often subtle and unconscious, but sometimes overt and damaging, are left unchallenged? This damage can take years to rectify. 
And I would stress that all children, not just children of colour, are damaged if they are allowed to hold negative or insulting ideas about racial difference that are left unchallenged. Schools need to acknowledge and support the delicate process of identity development, both of white British children and of those who embody difference. Teaching needs to take place about cultural differences and our similarities, about social justice and instances where we as a country haven't made it in terms of social justice. And we must engage with the experience and knowledge of the children in our classrooms. Even in a majority white classroom, there will be knowledge and experience of difference. This needs to be seen as a resource that can be brought to the fore to disrupt the narrative that only that the only experiences that matter in the curriculum and in the hidden curriculum is whiteness and Britishness. This will signal to the whole school community that all identities are valid and worthy of acknowledgement and exploration. Next slide, please. There have been specific stages in education policy responding to di responding to diversity in schools. These stages have moved between the ideas of assimilation, all children should be taught British culture, seen as British middle class culture in the 60s and 70s, to multicultural multiculturalism after the acknowledgement that black children were underachieving and being disproportionately disciplined and excluded. The Swan Report of 1985 heralded the promotion of teaching about different cultures with at the time an emphasis on multicultural teaching in inner city schools. Anti-racism was prevalent in some local authorities from the mid 80s to the passing of the Race Relations Amendment Act in 2000. The anti-racist movement in education identified that institutional racism operates in British institutions, including schools. Institutional racism can be unwitting and is not attributable to individual actions, but then nevertheless its effects are pernicious, disadvantaging children and people of colour. Since this time, there have been other twists and turns in dictates regarding how race and difference or sameness and cohesion should be presented in schools. The compulsory teaching of British values, the imperative to teach about community cohesion and the prevent agenda have all shifted the emphasis and the focus of what needs to be taught and how. However, there has been a constantly prevalent set of voices insisting that racial and cultural difference and not just Britishness needs to be on the educational agenda. I am proud to be associated with this guidance and those people who have been involved with it, who are among these voices. This guidance suggests that schools need to get fully involved with exploring diversity in our society and that simultaneously they need to be open to exploring the facts of social injustice. Next slide, please. So what can we make of MP Kemi Badenoch's recent speech, which suggests that projects such as our race equality guidance are by def definition wrongheaded. Can we offer another set of perspectives to those offered by the MP? I'd like to take just a few minutes to look at the claims she's making and to offer an alternative perspective. Badenoch claims I want to be absolutely clear that the government stands unequivocally against critical race theory. Critical race theory, much like the idea of institutional racism, suggests that systems of racism operate to disadvantage many people of colour in society. Critical race theory claims that the idea that society is colour blind, with colour being irrelevant, is erroneous, and that the experiences of people of colour regarding racism need to be heard and incorporated into anti-racist strategies. To quote Badenoch's next claim, our curriculum does not need to be decolonised for the simple reason that it is not colonised. The campaigns to decolonise the curriculum initiate from the recognition that a colonial mindset may still permeate our schools. 
This refers to the taken for granted assumption that the West is best, that the project to colonise the world is one which we, sh we should look on with pride, and that our own way of looking at and of understanding the world is the only one that should carry any legitimacy. If we only teach from a Western worldview, in which other ways of seeing and other forms of knowledge production are at best irrelevant and at worst disparaged, then this is a sign that the curriculum is colonised. If the achievements of other cultures are never mentioned and other cultures are only framed as being exotic or traditional, then this is a sign that the curriculum is colonised. If only poets, literature, art, music and achievements that emanate from the West or from white people are explored and honoured, then this is a sign that the curriculum needs to be decolonised. I would suggest that we still have some way to go in making imaginative change before we can confidently say that our curriculum is not colonised. I'm looking at the time. I'm just going to be another two minutes, if that's OK. Badenoch claims that black history is not the history of institutional racism. Unfortunately, black history in the UK is indeed characterised by institutional racism. If black history is not the history of institutional racism, then how can we explain the racial injustice evident in our prisons, in our universities, in our mental institutions and in occupational achievement and progression? To quote Badenoff's claim regarding the Black Lives Matter movement, she says, that is why we do not endorse that movement, Black Lives Matter, on this side of the house. It is a political movement. Badenoch is right that there is a political dimension to the demands of the Black Lives Matter movement. All movements for social change are essentially political by nature, as is resistance to such movements. But to focus on the political nature of Black Lives Matter is to detract attention from the vigour of this youth-led movement in which our young people are pointing out systemic racisms in our institutions and coming together with a momentous unity to call clearly and eloquently for change. Last slide, please. How can our schools rise to the challenge of bringing issues of diversity into the curriculum? And how can the whole school approach involve the pupils with recognising and opposing injustice? To conclude, rather than seeing race equality teaching in terms of teaching about cultural traditions, we need to teach about culture as it is lived, fluid, dynamic and constantly changing and shifting. The most effective way to teach about culture is to look at culture from the perspective of pupils. And if we don't have this resource in the children in our classrooms, we need to source resources elsewhere. Identities are multiple and complex and shift according to context. I would argue that the most effective way to ensure a sense of belonging and a strong sense of identity is to embrace our shared history in what we teach. We need to be brave and not only teach about an idealised Britain whose history is blameless, we need to show how our identities are intertwined and we need to explain how we are all welcome and that we all need to recognise ourselves in the school curriculum. Matters on which I would agree with Kemi Badenoch, principally when she states race has been at the heart of our national community. This is true. Race seems to be forever lodged at the heart of our national conversation, be it Brexit or migration or even which ethnic groups are most severely affected by COVID. As race is so central to who we are as a nation, to where we have been and to where we might be going, we need to ensure that our schools serve to make our children fluent in understanding the impact and consequence of race and racism and to equip them to be part of race's eventual overcoming. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Yar. Um, I think um, before I just ask Bola to um, present her slides, I just want to say I, I, there's some of the thoughts around um, your words, what I've highlighted here, you've talked about, you know, what worked for you in terms of primary school, great leadership and sense of community. Um, and I also really thank you for offering this alternative perspective. Um, 
And then finally, I think your point about you know imaginative change. So thank you very much. You did also talk about resources and practice. So um, with that point, I'll move on to uh, Bola. And Bola, you will have until 7.50. So you have, sorry, it's, it's, it's uh, ah, are we having, are we having Bola or are we having Mandy? I can't. <laughs> I, yeah, so when we get to Bola, great, fantastic, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Bola and I'm a deputy head teacher in Little Horsted Primary School and I've just joined this September, so I'm quite new to the school. Next slide, please, Claire. So just a quick thing about context. Um, I've spent over 10 years in education and I've worked in very diverse areas to those which are less diverse and that ranges from London, West Africa, Brighton and now East Sussex. Um, my master's is in children's literature and I, for me that's really helped me have an extensive knowledge of the impact that rich texts can have on children and their understanding of the wider world. Um, race equality is something that has always been part of my teaching practice, it's not something that's new for me. In particular this year I feel really happy because I have an incredible head teacher that I'm working with who not only feels passionate about race equality but also supports my ambition and um, so that it's embedded in our curriculum so having leadership that supports you is really important I'd say as well. Next slide please go. Okay so I'm going to speak on three points now to the unconscious bias and um, stereotypes and non-racist versus anti-racist. So Unconscious bias, I see, I, I first sort of really had a distinct realisation of it during my master's, and that was when I particularly focused on the fairy tales. And it was that idea that I couldn't actually associate with any of the princesses in any of the tales, because they were white princesses, and the princes were also white. And the idea is that there are so many different multicultural fairy tales, but they seem to be focused on the white princesses, it does make it difficult for children of colour to associate with the protagonist or the antagonist. They just feel almost lost in that sense. So I think that's something to think about with our texts. I think it's really important that children are regularly exposed to those positive examples that they can get from other multicultural fairy tales. Next slide, please. OK, so thinking about unconscious bias now, I think it's really important to be aware of our own unconscious bias. And it's it's quite hard to kind of look at yourself and analyse that. But as educators and leaders, um, we all have them. And I think that it's important to acknowledge that so that way we can move forward from there. With children in school, it's important to find opportunities to explore and directly critique this in order to build their awareness of issues around racism. And unconscious bias is actually the most common form of racism in schools, and I've encountered that myself. It's more that sense rather than direct racism. And a way to kind of approach that, so a suggestion would be, next slide please, Claire. Um, looking at something as simple as this with a class. So looking at two images and asking the questions that are on the slide just gets the children to sort of see how they might have unconscious bias because it's quite a complex concept to think of, but I've used this very effectively, um, both in my last school and in my new school, and the response from the children are really interesting and the questions that they have on that. Next slide, please. Okay, and I think it's really important to preempt and acknowledge that these discussions can feel uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for children sometimes as well as adults. So before starting conversations about racism and race equality, I think it's really important that you talk about that it might feel uncomfortable for the children. And why is it uncomfortable for them? Why might it be uncomfortable for adults? And when I've asked children before, it's really interesting their responses. Sometimes they've said that maybe for adults it's uncomfortable because they may remember a time they may have shown unconscious bias or been racist and hadn't meant to be. So for them to actually acknowledge that could be uncomfortable. Next slide, please. So another slide that I often use in school, thinking about non-racist and anti-racist, and there is a clear distinction between them. The children do understand it as long as you explain it to them really well, and it 
helps them to feel empowered. So rather than being sort of passive, they're more active. So this slide is a sort of suggestion of some questions that you might ask. How might a non-racist person behave as opposed to an anti-racist person? And how are they different? And looking at that um, distinction between the words. Next slide, please. So once the terminology has been unpicked, having some suggestions like the following, having some examples and getting children to identify whether they think it's non-racist or anti-racist and then linking to have they seen any examples of this in the news and what impact does it have if you're non-racist and what impact does it have if you're anti-racist and children do tend to see that being anti-racist um, have an impact. They sometimes link it to thinking about bullying and thinking about being the bystander and just watching it happen and not really doing anything about it than those who report to a teacher or take matters into their own hands and say stop it. Um, so that's quite effective in school also. Next slide please. Thinking about the wider curriculum. So often issues in you know to do with racism are mainly encountered I'd say through PSHE whereas this is something I showed in maths. So these statistics were gathered May 2020, so this year, and we often look at statistics, but let's look at some really effective statistics that we can discuss with the children. And unpicking statistics like this is really informative for the children. It allows you to see their opinions on it. And when they question those survey results or they see if it's surprising to them, they then can discuss how can the statistics be changed? So what could we do to change these statistics? So the fact they might be able to have an impact or they can suggest an impact could be had and what could be done. Next slide, please. Oh, my favourite. So this is a very small selection of a massive list of book titles I have um, that could be explored with children in school and included on bookshelves and in school libraries. Now, some of them are that they directly feature children of colour. Some of them don't, if you have a little look. And there is a good reason for that, because I think that there are lots of issues that can happen to children of colour and around that sort of um, area. And I don't think it has to be a book that just simply says it's a child of colour featured. So there are some books in there as well that sort of highlight the issues that can be encountered. However, next slide please be careful with some books so I did love this book until I read it a bit more um, it's a great book however one of the characters in, in there which is Anna Hibiscus's cousin is called Chocolate which already has issues so I think just being careful of some of the books you choose that um, are trying to promote diversity next slide please okay so terminology um, I understand, and from speaking to colleagues of mine before, that terminology can be an area of which makes teachers a little afraid. So how do they refer to people and what do they say and what's correct and what's not? I did speak to my class about this um, this year, my previous class, and we were focusing on the fact that it's important to identify individuality. So for myself, I prefer to be called a person of colour. Um, the common assumption is that I would prefer to be called black, but I have mixed heritage. My parents are Nigerian and Brazilian, so I prefer to be called a person of colour. And so I explain that to my class, as well as explaining that some people do prefer to be called black people, and that's fine, but we respect all those differences. And it is a matter of asking. So after that discussion, um, the children really understood that. And one lovely moment happened and one of the children in my class said wouldn't it be lovely if one day when we're referring to someone it doesn't have to be about the colour of their skin it's more about the character or what they're like something to think about so next slide a little more on terminology is so racism tends to be this umbrella term that we use but i think it's really important that children know if we're talking about racism discrimination prejudice in isolation and then married together. Um, so they're really clear. So we're all, all speaking the same language as such and we're referring to this terminology. Um, so that's really important to do. And thinking about have they seen this in the news? Have they heard of it anywhere? They are quite aware of things. The children in my class 
saw the Black Lives Matter, they saw the protests and things about George Floyd. So it is bringing that to the table also. Next slide, please. OK, so promoting cultural diversity. And for me, this is less of us and them. I think it's more about sameness and difference and embracing those. So the next slide is a bit of a contentious issue. And if you go to the next, please, Claire. Um, it's to do with Black History Month. Now, it can be seen in two ways. It can be a positive, but it could also be a negative. Now, my general experience of schools in the UK is that when it tends to happen, and let's be honest, when it's Black History Month, it's usually a week. I've not seen it in any schools so far where it's been a whole month. Um, it tends to be quite tokenistic. And that's what is my slight hesitation with it. For the first time this year, I chose not to celebrate it. And I spoke to my class about why. And they actually recognised and said, well, why is it only for one month of a year? What happens to the other 11 months? So I'd say if it's going to be celebrated, that's absolutely great to highlight and to celebrate cultural diversity. But it should still be running through the curriculum and not just put to bed for the other um, 11 months, because for a child of colour and even for children who are white, it's almost like saying for one month you're seen and then what happens? Okay. Next slide, please. So where does it start for children? Um, for many children, their first encounter of black history is the slave trade. And that's where they think black history begins. I've encountered so many children who think that all descendants, so all people of colour, descended from the slave trade. They are so certain of it until you kind of explore the different ideas and topics in history. So I remember sitting in school many years ago as a child and going back to what you asked, and I felt so uncomfortable because it, there was an assumption that I was descended, that my family had descended from slaves and haven't, but there was that sort of um, feeling and very uncomfortable. I think being mindful of diversity in all the national curriculum history topics will help to avoid skewed learning experiences because black people existed through history. So we've got through the Tudors and Victorians and not just having that skewed view. Next slide, please. Being mindful of our display boards and our classroom environments. So when you're having characters on the display boards, are they culturally diverse? Are they you know, are the children seeing this diversity within their classroom environments? Children are often exposed to negative images outside of school. Let's say on, for example, watching adverts where they are shown poverty, charity, aid, being in Africa. Um, they're not seeing adverts for hair that are diverse or skin products. So it's really important within your classroom environment that that's shown. Next slide, please. Um, in my experience, children tend to associate people of colour with being rappers, musicians, or within the sports field. The exposure for them to see mathematicians, inventors, scientists, writers, poets, that indirectly challenges unconscious bias and stereotypes. So please do pick um, key figures for the children to look at. And next slide, please. Think about curriculum development and we'll keep going. Thank you. Next slide, please, Claire. OK, so um, I think first of all, looking at current topics being taught and seeing if they're presented in the way that there might have been an admittance from the topic. Is it just very skewed for white British history? Have assumptions been made about a country being explored in geography? So saying this is a poor, this is rich. And I will um, have examples of this on the next slide. The names used in questions and model text, so if you're doing talk for writing. So I find that children can say names of footballers like Didier Drogba with no problem at all because they're exposed to them. They see these names. So it shouldn't be a tripping over names type of issue. Having different um, names that the children can experience saying really helps also. Next slide, please. I love the sustainable development goals. However, when trying to find an image that because I was looking at not having poverty. I spent 20 minutes trying to find an image showing no poverty without a person of colour holding their hands out and I have not been successful so far. So being mindful of images that can lead to stereotypes. So 
um, the next slide will show how I started my current topic, which is based on World War II. That's the image I had up on my screen with those four questions. And it was really interesting having the responses from the children because I remember having on the first day of this topic, I had two children who told me they knew everything about World War II. They studied it all in the half term. I put the image up. And some suggested that they were slaves, some said they were farmers, some said they were land workers. And then one child said, I think they might be soldiers because they're wearing similar things. So starting the topic with an image that may not be predictable to get the children's questions. And it's like a catalyst to their questions. Some of the questions I had, why wasn't this photo in my World War II book? How were they linked to World War II? Were they treated fairly? What happened to them? What about in India? So it's a really effective way. Oh, well, I'm just going to uh, put it because I've given you, I'm going to give you, because um, you've got such brilliant slides coming up. Yeah. It just means that we have a bit less time for discussion at the end. But yeah. if um, I sh actually I haven't given participants any chance, but I'm going to give you another two minutes. Um, two minutes. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, and next slide. I'll whiz through it. Linking the history. So empathy shown for child evacuees, maybe linking also to refugees, so children could develop a wider sense of empathy and understanding. Next slide, please. And then even bringing it to the to present day, and this happened on the 30th of October, so when the children were looking at evacuees and siblings being split, they can see that that doesn't always have to happen. Okay. Next slide, please. <laughs> I'm really whizzing through. Um, so this is one of the books that I was saying that's not directly linked to colour and you can see that it features environmentalism, displacement, idea that some lives are viewed less than others, which can then link to peaceful protests and things like Pansy, Black Lives Matter and anti-racism also. I will just end, on I've, I've only got one minute left, um, but I'm very mindful, next slide please, of staff wellbeing, time, time constraints and where to start because I'm actively teaching and I know what it's like. Um, Hackney have developed um, a diverse curriculum to help decolonise the curriculum and it's completely free to schools, there can be one login, but it's all the way from early years to secondary and I have looked at the resources, they can be adapted and changed and just, next slide please, just to show. Um, so for example, you can see the Tudors, the Victorians featured and they have PowerPoints and plans that can be changed. I will stop there because my time is up, but um, I hope that's helpful. I love your last slide. Would you please speak to that before we let you go? I can do it. So, um, yeah, this phrase I often hear, I don't see colour, I just see a person. We do see colour. Okay. But it's more about um, the, the colour not being a barrier or a difference that is negative. It's about embracing those differences and the cultural diversity. Thank you. Thank you, Bola. Fantastic. Um, and then we've had lots of questions about... So, Claire, if you go back and when I, when I waffle on here, if you go back to Mandy's start of her presentation. Um, I love the way you've talked about, you know, examples around linking that discussion to bullying and the bystander. Um, it's fantastic. And your example around using statistics and maths in relation to really integrating it within teaching and learning and the curriculum. Um, thanks for raising the issue around terminology. It's uh, it's you know really important for us you know as as um, manager in the children's service department we obviously are conscious of the different terminology used between individuals but there's a sense of what do we use as a whole term so that even as a department and as a local authority we're having conversations about that but brilliant thank you very much and we will send you all the links obviously to the books and put them on season as well because people have raised that um, brilliant. Thank you, Bola. Fantastic. And um, now I'll turn to Mandy. Um, Dr. Mandy Curtis is going to talk further about uh, resources and she also will give us some more examples. But Mandy, over to you now. Thank you, Atia. Good evening, everybody. Um, Claire, shall we just go through quite quickly? Go to the next slide, please. So this is just, um, uh, I wanted to give you a snapshot of what our website looks like, actually. 
um, so that if you get to the education page, you can find us. Um, I have been a teacher in East Sussex and in London. I'm currently a lecturer with the University of Brighton part time. Um, I've been an activist since the early 80s. I've been I am a parent of mixed heritage children, so we've been through the system as a, a family um, and I've been running 18 hours for 12 years, although I've worked in development education for 20 years. So if you read development education as global learning, we very much um, work towards whole school approaches, which Buller and um, Yara have both been talking about. So we work with schools to develop whole, schools, whole school approaches to uh, global learning and particularly, you know, trying to make those connections between the local and the global. So it's not all happening elsewhere. It's very much part of our local community. Thank you, Claire. Next slide. I've left this film in, although I don't have time and or the ability to show you. It's just a very short film that I'd recommend that you have a look at if you take a look through the slides later. Uh, Grace Chitty interviews these children and talk talks to them about uh, whether they've seen people that look like themselves in the books that they read. Um, and I'll leave it to you to imagine which of those children identify with characters in books that they read and which haven't seen themselves in a book, which is very sad. And in fact, you know, here she says that only 4% of children's book heroes are from a, a black, Asian and minority ethnic background. Uh, Grace goes on to interview Nathan Bryan, who is the author of the book Look Up. Um, he's won quite a few awards with the book and he's uh, put, put it together jointly with Dapo Adiola, who is only one of two black British illustrators. Um, and that's a theme that I'm going to come uh, to a little bit more as well, looking at different authors. Next slide, please. So this is Werner Alette Wilkins, whose son came home having uh, coloured in a picture of himself and coloured himself as pink. Werner offered him a brown crayon, but he said it had to be, he had to draw himself in pink because it was for a, a class book that they were developing. Um, and Werner went on and um, established her own publishers and is um, an, an author, children's author. Next slide. Um, Darren Chetty was finding sort of similar things when he was working with um, school children that if he was asking children to write a story, the characters that they wrote would be traditional, would have traditional English names and would speak English as a first language. And that didn't matter what the ethnic backgrounds of the children were. The lead characters, you know, tended to be white and um, speak English. That's something else that Sally out the Chowcraft, I'll mention her later on a slide, has, has also found in her research that um, children, you know, struggle with that sense of identity and belonging that Yar was talking about. So I, I recommend um, Sally out the Chowcraft's research too. Let's go on. We have an, a library at 18 hours. Um, most development education centres like ourselves have a charge for their library. We, we don't, to be honest, we don't have time to administer that. And we just want schools to be using our books. Um, so we have different collections. I'll introduce you to some, some of them as, as, as we go through the slides. But none of our non-fiction books are older than 10 years old. So if you're a governor with some purchasing power in schools, please update the non-fiction text in the classroom. Um, things change so much that beyond 10 years, you know, they tend to not have a, um, a use. We retain a few, but they tend to be used for examples of bad practice. So the example here of homes in um, Kenya, you can see there, uh, without giving the reflection of churches, skyscrapers, petrol stations, traffic jams, you know, a, a very traditional uh, view of Kenya. Next slide, please. So what we really try and do with our libraries is uh, offer the books that have a balance. So yes, there are rural settings, but there are also the urban settings. So there's rich and poor, traditional and contemporary and local and global. So we try and cover everything and, and everything in between. So the children tidy enough in this book just happen to be of East Asian um, heritage. 
but they could be children tidying up their bedroom anywhere in the in the world. Next one. This is one of our favourites, the Librarian of, ba of Basra, and um, this helps children to, to really focus on similarities. We talked a lot this evening about similarities and differences, and we really encourage you to start with the similarities and the commonalities that we have with each other before we move to difference. Um, so celebrate contributions of, of people from around the world. So this is a, a charming story about a woman who saves her, her library during the war. Let's come on. We also encourage um, books that uh, encourage confidence in talking about skin colour and hair. A actually, I did add another um, picture today because there was a news story just today about hair love and Beyonce and JC's daughter Blue Ivy is going to narrate the story from the Oscar winning film. So that's coming out as an, another new book. But, but really, you know, to challenge the quote there, no, I mean the other Betsy, the one with the normal skin, because what we find is that white skin isn't considered, a, a, considered as an ethnicity. White skin tends to be considered as the norm. Let's go to the next one. Um, and like Bola was saying, you know, be careful about the books that you offer. So, you know, when we first saw Clever Sticks, we thought it was going to be a lovely book about a little Chinese boy. But actually the story, you know, just tells that he's rubbish at doing everything. You know, it's not a positive image. He's not normalised. He's singled out as part of the story. So much better to find um, characters that just happen to be of black, Asian and minority ethnic heritage but are also the scientists and mathematicians that Bonner was talking about. Next one. This is a new one in our library that we love. So um, Ibtahaj Mohammed is a, a US uh, Olympic champion in fencing, and she has written a, a story about growing up and wanting to be the proud owner of her, her blue hijab. Next one. This is another good one. You know, um, Yar was talking about decolonizing the curriculum on whether it's necessary. These, these books are written from the perspective of the indigenous communities. So giving the indigenous communities a voice. The one on the left is a fantasy story from Australia. The one on the right is set in Central America. Next slide. Nikki Daly's always been one of our favourites. So charming stories set in South Africa, often a relationship with um, women in the stories and and of grandma. So we had an idea of of what of who Nikki Daly was. Next slide, and here he is. It's not the idea that we had. Um, so we we have sort of made an assumption about this author. Yes, books are more diverse. We're getting more and more diverse books, but we're not necessarily getting those diverse authors. And that's something that we've been working to try and gather lists, particularly of black British authors um, and black British stories that reflect our local communities. Next one. And here's one of our favourites, Trish Cook gorgeous story of so much, but she's written several books um, from black British family perspectives. Next slide. So how do we start to, or where do we begin to develop governor and teacher confidence? Um, first point, please, Claire. So 33% of children in, in the UK are of BAME heritage. And in East Sussex, that's 13.6 um, children in our schools. So we have a responsibility and a commitment to this. Next point. This is Chimananda Ngozi Adichie. I'd love to show you her film. I just recommend you all go and see, go and watch it. If you can't watch the full 19 minutes, look at the little three minute clip. But she talks about a single story and of the, the white heroines and princesses that Bola was talking about. Next one. Next one. Um, be aware of current politics um, when you're teaching about diversity in schools. So thinking about, you know, the most hidden British community at the moment. I, don't, I haven't got the chance to sort of interact with you and ask the question, but I wonder whether you know who who is the most hidden community. 
Uh, next bullet point. And it, it at the moment is the Chinese community and particularly next point as well around um, COVID at the moment, you know, horrible comments that are being said to the Chinese community in relation to COVID-19. Next bullet point. Thank you. So, you know, what, what can you do and how can you develop a confidence? Uh, um, obviously, Ati has already mentioned the PSHE hubs that uh, exist in um, East Sussex, but there's also a new collective for um, teachers or governors perhaps living in Brighton or having a connection with Brighton called the Educators of Colour Collective. And what they're really trying to do is challenge teaching ar around diversity. Next one. Um, I just wanted to say you don't have to know all the answers. You know, I've been teaching 20 years <laughs> about diversity. I don't know all of the answers, but I have an inquiring mind. I want to know the right things. I want to know the right terminology, as Bola was saying, and, and ask people, you know, how they wish to be referred to. Next slide. So I try and keep up to date. First point. Um, and, you know, really, I'm sort of thinking here, does the staff team reflect the community? So uh, Runnymede and the National Education Union have, have developed some really useful resources looking at diversity in schools, looking at uh, visible minorities, sorry, next bullet point, and invisible teachers, next bullet point. Um, does the school have a framework for race equality? So it, Atia um, showed us the race equality guidance checklist at the back of the East Sussex County Council document. Stella Dadsey did st sterling work 20 years ago. Um, it's still around. She was on Women's Hour yesterday, so it was good to listen to her. She's still around. Um, and the next bullet point, the next one, and the next one, sorry. Yeah, and the National Edu Education Union have a whole framework that's really useful. And it was referred to on the parliamentary uh, debate that took place last week. Next bullet point. So does the school have structures in place to ensure accountabil accountability? These resources will help you think about that. And last bullet point. But don't, please don't ask the black employees to fix institutional racism. So some more research from the NEU, you know, they discovered, you know, just how much black staff are being unfairly treated, that there's a widespread patterns of discrimination related to stereotyping of black staff and more BAME staff, you know, having their capabilities questioned um, in teaching. Next slide. So what can we do to help? We're in Betts Hill, first point, and we have a free resources library. We actually have um, free CDs that we can give to you for, for your school uh, for, uh, toolkit that we developed with teachers. It was a little while ago, but it was around those key topics and how to fit equality and diversity into to common topics. So they exist as free CDs to schools. So, you know, if you're further from Betts Hill and can't get to us, just email us and we'll pop one in the post to, to you. Next bullet point. Our resources, a lot of them come as collections, so you can't see them in the in the picture in our library. So we have boxes and that most of those boxes are available to look at through um, our website. The idea is that they contain a reading source. They have some teaching materials and artifacts, some ideas for teaching. So we're not sending exotic artifacts into schools, but we know that if they go and are used as a collection, that they're hopefully being used responsibly. Next one. We're the British Council Local Advisors for this enormous area that is Sussex, Kent and Surrey, but it gives you access to free to free teacher training in your school. So if you have school linking and you um, enroll with the British Council, they'll put you in touch with us. I mean, obviously you can come to us and we can put you in touch with the British Council the other way as well. Next one. So we do 
offer training to schools. We do look at the whole school approach. We do that, at, you know, paid or we do it free where we can through the British Council option. Next one. Uh, our current research, as I said, is on um, the black British authors for, for children. So we've got a new collection that we're just pulling together. And next point. And we want to really develop that um, collection working with teachers. So we've got some teachers that have already enlisted for a diversity book club. It hasn't started yet. I've got to find the funding somehow to, to do that. Atsi has put me in touch with somebody. Um, but the idea is that we would be sending books into schools at no cost. And, and the te this has come from a request from teachers, actually. So um, we, that's hopefully going to be our next project for schools. I think that's it. Sorry, I've rushed through. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Thank you, Mandy. Um, brilliant, um, brilliant final presentation. Um, and in fact, you have, I'm getting a bit of feedback. Maybe if everybody else could um, mute their microphones. Uh, that's better. Lovely. So um, I just want to say, Mandy, thanks for that. And also to say that actually um, there have been some questions in the chat where people were asking about more resources and questions about training and more books. So actually, I think you have been uh, really helpful in answering some of those. So this is we've got the last 20 minutes to um, think about any questions to pose to the panel. So I also there was a question also about um, support from Governor Services and John Murray has put in the comments about actually getting in touch with Governor Services around ongoing uh, learning and development support for government for governors. Please contact him um, and John, if you could put your email on the chat, that would be fabulous, please. So I think in terms of the first question. Um, that I'd like to sort of put to all three of you is so Mandy Bola um, and Ya is what what if a school was starting and listening to you, what do you think should be their first steps? Okay, Bola. I think it's about looking at what about um, looking at what you already have. So looking at your existing topics. Don't make lots and lots and lots of work for yourselves, but look at your existing topics and just maybe looking at um, is it a skewed view of those topics? I mean, even when you look at ancient Egypt, show two different representations of Cleopatra, show the westernised version and then the, the, the true version <laughs> and see if that creates questions. Um, and I would look at your book corners and definitely your libraries. I would do that so that children have access to really good literature as well. Um, and I would also say communicating with parents is a really good thing as well. So having that communication between parents, school, schools and teachers, maybe having a little guide that could be sent home to parents so that they can talk to their children at home about race. So we're all speaking um, in the same terminology as well. And that's also reinforced at home. That's my bit. Mandy, can you answer that question as well? That'd be great. Um, yeah, I was just going to add to that. Um, I mean, Bola did mention school displays. So I think that's really important that you reflect diverse Britain, you know, even when you, um, perhaps you were in a, a majority or perhaps even more so when you're in a majority white, white school. Um, and I like that idea of working with parents where you often encourage schools to work with parents and don't just invite them in for a bit of exotic cooking, but, you know, come in and talk about their roles and um, talk about what jobs they do um as as well so positive op options there and yeah yeah um yeah just as a last thought um just explore the diversity that that is unseen amongst the children because even if it's a majority white classroom or an all right white classroom there will still be aunties um friends that they still will have knowledge of the world so allow them to bring that in and i think that that's a really important resource for them to be proud of the knowledge that they have thanks thanks yeah i'm just picking up so i just uh, making sure of this of the time that's really helpful so i think we've got 
sort of a whole range of of things in terms of the first steps. And as Bella was saying, and the others, and Mandy's also um, pointed to this, is to look at that guidance, that checklist. And actually, I think Lou Carter, who's my manager's on this call, and actually it was her idea to have this checklist. It was a brilliant idea because actually, please have a look at it. And it's really good on one page, all the things that we should be um, you know, starting off with in schools. I think there's something about, um, I would like, I'm not, I think it was, I'm not sure, I think maybe it was, yeah, your, your point about the racist incidents and not seeing that as an aberration, but really thinking about that in the sense of having that so preventative um, approach, thinking of it as a whole school approach. And I, I think, I can't remember if it was Yar who, who, who said that, so whoever it was, if they could talk about that and the others jump in. Yeah, um, I was just sort of feeding back from the research that I did 10 years ago in, in a school in East Sussex. Um, and the school was, were very, very willing and very quick to say that they resolved racist incidents, that, that they, they were dealt with. They, they were they were sort of, um, you know, the children were punished and, and, and this sort of quite a sort of hard line approach to racist incidents. And yet there didn't seem to be any acknowledgement that these incidents were part of a bigger picture um, and that they weren't just things, they weren't just a flash in the pan. They they were they were part of, of a wider discourse that wasn't actually being um, encouraged in the school. Um, so I, I just felt it's really important to point out racist incidents aren't just about that incident, but they're, they they need to be spoken about maybe even not in a draconian way but that there needs to be a whole school picture um given about diversity it's not just enough to say we do diversity because we deal with racist incidents which that school seemed to be suggesting Bola and M mandy mandy uh, yeah i was going to add a little bit to that so when we've done the um training with schools, particularly around terminology, you know, we've tried to include the whole school, you know, that's part of the whole school approach. So we've included governors, we've included the lunchtime supervisors, we've included the teaching assistants, because sometimes the difficulties around um, addressing terminology in the schools, you know, will come, you know, well, they're often those those terms appear on the playground you know and so we need to equip the staff to to challenge and and to be current really we don't want to offend people with the terminology we use um i think that it's also important to think about the fact that children do it so thinking outside the playground and out of the school context when i started talking to my class about terminology Lots of them spoke about the racist incidences that had happened at football matches, and two of them had actually been at a football match and heard, you know, the racist names being called, seen things thrown. And I'm wondering if I hadn't started speaking about that, would they have brought that up? And and it, they did say how it made them feel, even though they were white. And they said that they were just so upset by it, and to see adults doing that. So I think that by talking about it, opening school, it does open doors to things that they might encounter outside also. Thank you. I'm just picking up a comment. Um, well, that's really helpful around bringing that sense of, you know, what's happening outside and bringing that alive, you know, and I think that picks up that point. Um, Peter Davis said, do panel think children are instinctively racist or is it a learned aberration? And I think what we're all saying is, you know, this is it's about the systems and coming back to Yar's point about systemic racism and the impact of that. Um, and I the, the comment above around saying um, it would be great to have a follow up after leaders and governors have had a chance to digest the guidance. And I'm thinking that would be great to do. And actually what would be good is to have, um, you know, the presenters um, from schools so to have you know three or four schools present around how it worked um in their school you know what were the pitfalls what worked what didn't work that would be great to to hear from them and you know and the one after that would be great to have some feedback from our pupils um, and young people around you know 
from their point of view around uh, you know what worked for them and um, you know if, if a school has established a group which involves pupils and parents around the whole school approach be great to have you on there you know we're happy to facilitate that conversation now that we're in the, the post-covid world where we can organize events um, quite quickly and get a lot of people around the table um, the virtual screen and we don't have to drive anywhere actually we can put together um, you know virtual events quite quickly um, and